well, 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 theology nerds. Guess what? The one and only Keith Ward is back on homebrewed Christianity. That is right. The one and only Professor Keith Ward. Mm Mm-hmm. The Keith Ward, who, I don't know, I don't know, might just be one of the most prolific living theologians, was the Queen's Regent Professor at Oxford University, a specialist in religious pluralism, religion and science, has published one of my favorite books. Recently, he published two two books, and I think there's a third coming. Um, The Christian Idea of God, a Philosophical Foundation for Faith, and then Christ and the Cosmos, a Reformulation of Trinitarian Doctrine. They're both amazing texts. But his new book, Love is His Meaning, it's a book about the under, understanding the teachings of Jesus in a non-literal way. And today on the podcast, Keith Ward, philosopher, who then came to be a Christian uh, after uh, leaving his atheism behind as a philosopher, engaging in science conversations and such, be- believes in God before he ever became a Christian. What is it like for this philosopher, turned Christian, turned theology professor, to read scripture? We're going to talk about the Bible with Keith Ward. Now, before we get started, there are two two things I must do. What are they, you may say, or you may not. You may have just skipped forward, which is depressing because they aren't going to take that long. You know what I mean? Number one, go to theologybeercamp.com. Tickets are about to go on sale if you're listening to this the day it releases, or they may still be available if you are listening, you know, on a different day. But this summer, August of 2018, the 15th, 16th, 17th, we're having an amazing event. What is it? Theology Beer Camp. Mm-hmm. That's right. Theology Beer Camp in Asheville, North Carolina. It's going to be in the one and only Habitat Brewery. We're going to be tasting the lovely, delicious craft beer of Asheville, North Carolina. We're going to be joined by a whole host of theological friends, including Travis McMacken and Robin Henderson. Activist theologian. Boom. That's what I'm talking about. It's all going down. It's all going down. And if you're smart, you went to theologybeercamp.com. You click the little blue button so you can leave your email so you get access to the tickets a day early and $50 cheaper than everybody else. All right. And that was just one. There were two things. Two things I got to give shout, shout, shout outs to Dana from Plymouth, Michigan, James from Globe, Arizona, and Mark from Newark. Delaware. Why? Because James, Dana, and Mark are brand new members of the Homebrewed Christianity community. They went to homebrewedcommunity.com. They signed up. They're supporting this podcast every month. They're going to be a part of what? Oh, the members group on Facebook. They're going to get access to all sorts of extra downloadable goodies. Mm Mm-hmm. That's right. So you should tell them thank you because they're helping provide for this amazing podcast. And you can be cool like them, too. And not only that, here's the thing. When you donate, when you're a member of the community, you get your own ecclesiastical title. You could be an acolyte. You could be a bishop. You could be an elder. You could be a deacon. You know? Yeah. I mean, people just think back in life. There was that person who said, there's no chance you're going to ever be an elder. You're like, I can do that. Or or maybe, maybe you didn't grow up in, an, in a in a very, very high church and you're no longer a kid and you said, I missed my chance to be an acolyte because they just don't let, you know, adults robe up and do the candle things at the beginning. But you're like, I can be an acolyte at home through Christianity. And everyone has goals. And if that's one of them, <laughs> then we try to help. All right. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode because I enjoy talking to Keith. And there's more fun and exciting news about stuff we'll be doing with Keith in the future, so I don't want to tell you that now, but it'll happen. All right? So all the way from across the big old pond, the one and only Keith Ward. Enjoy. Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Tripp, and back on the podcast is the one and only Keith Ward, uh, so excited for you to be here. Okay, it's great to be with you, Trip. And um, you just had a new book come out called "Love Is His Meaning: Understanding 
the teachings of Jesus and it, and it wrestles yeah. with the teachings of Jesus and and in a non-literal way. And I'm in the middle of putting together a group of a couple thousand progressive Christians trying to actually read the Bible and not just books about it. So maybe we could begin with you telling us your own relationship with Scripture and how it's changed over your career. Gosh, how far back do you want me to go? That's a lot of years. Uh, (laughs) uh, I started, well, um, I started life as a philosopher, so I didn't start with Scripture. And then, uh, so I came to Christianity by a rather odd route, really. I decided that atheistic philosophies were really... um, not um, very convincing. So then I got interested in Christianity. Uh, then uh, I did begin to read the Bible. I, got, I actually got um, involved with a group of rather fundamentalist Christians. They weren't progressive at all. They were wonderful people. And um, in their company, I believe that I encountered Christ. So there was a personal relationship there. And some of I read the Bible coming out of that, really. After that, I became a professional much later in my life, a professional theologian, taught at Oxford, and so I had to read the Bible for my job. (laughs) And um, uh, I've always been interested in how to interpret it, and uh, I keep links with my old uh, friends who uh, I still call my fathers in God, that they were really, but uh, one of them sent me a Christmas card this year, and he said, thanks, I've read one of your books, he said, and um, and I'm, I'm pleased to say some of it was sound. <laughs> so there you are. I'm not without hope. <laughs> anyway, my story is in uh, giving um, interpretations of the New Testament particularly, yeah, and the language of the New Testament, yeah. So when you, uh, as a philosopher, kind of – kind of come to the conclusion that the kind of dominant assumptions in a lot of the academy around atheism or a kind of really strict reductive um, naturalism, uh, you come to resist them. How then, as a philosopher who is inspired by idealism, do you come to Scripture differently than someone who has been reading the stories over and over and had to reinterpret them each kind of level of psychological depth they grow through or stages of development and such? Yeah, well, that's right. I don't know if there's a particular way. I suppose I'm, I might come at it – with an interest in language. You know, philosophers in America and the UK are very interested in uses of language and how, how you use words and what they can mean and how you test uh, them for truth and rationality. So that's that's an approach I take. And, and um, I find that sometimes people who read the Bible seriously and read it a lot um, read it inconsistently. That is, they take some take the teachings of Jesus, the recorded words of Jesus in the Gospels. Uh, some pe- people uh, take them in different ways. So sometimes they take them literally, uh, and then other times they don't. But they don't have any principle about that. I mean, things you can't take literally, for example, in Jesus' teaching are um, give to everyone who asks. You couldn't give to everybody who asked. You'd have no money left in a week, so that would be the end of that. So you know you can't take that literally. But then other things they sometimes do take literally, like saying that uh, you will see the Lord coming on the clouds, and they say, oh, yeah, that's literal. So I'm looking for a reading of the whole teaching, which is consistent, which takes one line of interpretation throughout, you know, so not some bits literal and some bits not literal, but a, but a consistent reading. So I'm interested in, in that. Mm-hmm. So how would you describe the relationship between um, the Scripture as a historical human text set in cultures and situations and the Scripture as a sacred, inspired text? Oh Well, uh, I've got no trouble with saying it's an inspired text, uh, but I, the imp- I think the very important thing about the Christian Gospels is that there are four of them, uh, that they're really quite different. I mean, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar in their approach, though there are still differences. But John is really completely different. and mm-hmm. comes, uh, uh, John starts off with uh, the creation. You know, in the beginning was the word, whereas uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke start off with the life of the birth of Jesus, really, or the teaching, uh, preaching of Jesus. So um, it's 
I think it's very important for a Christian view of revelation to say we don't have one account of Jesus and we have none of Jesus. Jesus didn't write anything down. We don't have right. anything that he wrote down or he didn't recite anything to be remembered. Uh, they're just things they somebody happened to remember and passed down and then got written about in different ways. Uh, and that's a very important view that what we've got are the the people who believed in Jesus, they wrote down what they ha had remembered or been told about and knew of Jesus through their experience. They wrote that down. But you've got four different approaches. So it's like four people looking at you or me, and they're writing down what they remember of what we said mm -hmm. and what they think of us. They'd all be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important because it, what it shows is uh, there's not just one truth in christianity you know, there are lots of true things jesus did exist jesus did die on the cross i think jesus did rise from the dead but there are very different ways of interpreting these things and those differences go right back to the gospels so. well one of the things that i've kind of emphasized around the diversity in scripture is that the church even had options of canonizing uh like tatian's harmony gospel where you have a single telling with no contradictions, no variations and such, and yet it canonized four different divergent texts who the church recognized across its geographic and, and, and the makeup of the people as ones that resonate with the presence of Christ in their midst. And the yeah. two sides of that diversity and process of canonization that I find Im important, like one is just recognizing the diversity. The other side is – how do we as Christians today understand God's relationship to the world and history, and in particular the religious community, such that its decisions in canonizing or having councils or having fights about good issues and such, um, how do we see God at work in that whole process of these texts becoming scripture and these texts being interpreted over time? Well, I think uh, I am that uh, – if I can put it like this, what God is saying in this process is that it is a historical and changing process. That it's not just one picture of Jesus which is given to us. And John's Jesus is presented in a very different way, the eternal word of God becoming a flesh from Mark's Jesus, who is, you know, this charismatic prophet, really. Um, and as you go through history, Jesus continually gets reinterpreted. So you have the liberation Christ who's concerned with the, the poor to be liberated from oppression. And then you have the uh, Christ, the judge of the world, Christos Pantocrator, you get in Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox churches, but mm -hmm. a rather um, grim, really, figure <laughs> looming over the congregation as a sort of threat. Uh, and you get all sorts of different interpretations. I think that that diversity of Scripture itself says that's okay. Uh, you are in a historical process. You, you can't just repeat the past as it was. That, that's the evangelical mistake sometimes, to say we can get back to the past. You can't get back to the past. If you try to do that, you just make a different future. <laughs> and uh, so that so to see it as a living change. I mean, the Spirit is at work changing things continually. So I think this is a work of the Spirit uh, and a very important thing to start with Christianity. There's no real complete unchanging presentation of Christianity. You know, there are, uh, so you must never think yours is the only truth. Yeah, you have to look at the whole range from Roman Catholic to Quaker, from Baptist to Anabaptist, uh, and, and they're all interpretations. Now, they can't all be as good, I suppose, but on the other hand, you stand in one of them, perhaps, we get attracted to one of them, uh, and you have to say, uh, well, uh, there is this diversity. I stand within it, and I'm in a process of historical change as well. So I suppose what that comes down to is the truth is a living, changing, historical, transforming truth. It's not uh, an unchanging uh, thing that I just have to believe, even if I can't make sense mm -hmm. of it. So, you know, some people could hear that and uh, then start to get worried that uh, God's too connected to the change. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I really appreciated about, I think it was a series of lectures you did. It was titled The Word of God? Question um, mark. Kind of on on reading uh, scripture in light of contemporary biblical scholarship that uh, there the. 
the way in which Scripture develops and our understanding of it changes over time is is connected to God's own investment in uh, history, and that the I- development of ideas in the Bible are not just humans continuing to come up with ways to tolerate what was embarrassing about past texts, but that God is present in and with the the people of God, helping them come to see the text and story from different perspectives and different conclusions. Yeah, I think that's right. It's a sort of, uh, I see it as a dual process, that God is always seeking to enlarge human understanding. And on the other end, humans are trying their best to understand. But uh, the humans don't get the pure, unchanging word. What they get is what their psychology and what their culture and their history enables them to get. So the process has to go on. So I see God almost as a cooperator uh, with human beings in progressively uh, disclosing more of the divine nature. Mm-hmm. So when you read the creation narratives and the creation text, how does the work you've done in uh, engaging natural sciences and, and such impact the way you read the creation stories in Genesis? Oh, it has a huge impact. Um, well, there are two impacts. First one is um, I not only read the Genesis story, I read the other uh, stories of creation from Babylonia and from Sumeria around that time, which are all in print and all on the web, and you can get hold of them. And you see that the creation story in the Bible is of the same sort, it's the same genre as those other things. And we call the other things myths. We don't worry We don't worry about that. We don't say, oh, there was a Marduk and a Tiamat and they really had a battle. We say, oh, that's a story uh, of uh, what it's like to have a civilized world coming out of chaos. So, so on that score, long before science started, I think people uh, who knew about ancient uh, Middle Eastern religion and their origins would have said, oh, well, yeah, the creation story, that, that fits into this uh, pattern of myth-making about the start. Who was there? After all, nobody was there. Uh, but it, it is divinely inspired. It is, when what it says, which is different from anything in Babylonia, is there was only one creator God who actually had a purpose for human fulfillment. And that's different. The, the, other, the other stories aren't quite like that. And then the science bit comes along later on. And I, but I, I would want to say first, it's not just science. People like Augustine never took Genesis literally. They didn't, they didn't say, oh, uh, these are six actual days. Augustine actually says um, that the word day in the, uh, in the Old Testament, in Genesis, doesn't mean a period of time at all. It just, it just means a logical category of things like plants, rocks, animals, mm-hmm. etc. So that sort of interpretation, non-literal interpretation, was well known by theologians long before science. Right. But then when science came along, uh, of course, it changed completely our view of the whole universe. And indeed, it was a Roman Catholic priest who, who helped to do this, uh, uh, Georges Lemaitre, uh, who uh, invented the Big Bang Theory. Uh, but the Big Bang Theory, you know, the universe has existed for 14,000 million years and it's expanding and there are other galaxies and other planets and we're just a small part of the whole story. Well, that's bound to change how you see Genesis. Uh, because Genesis speaks as though the earth is really the most important bit. It's just about the earth and it's about human beings. But if you put the earth as something which happened billions of years after the universe started, you you get a different take on the story. So those two bits come together, a a knowledge of Middle Eastern uh, early religion into which Genesis fits, and uh, also the scientific view which says, well, that just confirms that you shouldn't take it literally, um, but the truth that there is one creator of this vast universe, that's even more astounding than what it says in Genesis, really, and it's not incompatible with it. Mm -hmm. And when you think of the different metaphors scripture uses for creation and yeah. the relationship of of uh, uh, God and the world. Like what are the affirmations at the heart of a biblical depiction of creation that our scientific materialist assumptions and culture most ignore or minimize? Well, I think probably uh, a great deal of modern science is very much opposed 
to the same purpose in the universe. And a lot of biologists would say, oh, there's no purpose in evolution. It's not going anywhere. It's just uh, random or it's accidental or it's uh, something without plan or design. Um, and I think the Genesis creation account and the biblical belief in God would say, no, there is purpose in the universe. And that purpose is to do not just with human beings, uh, but with the evolution of intelligent uh, feeling, sentient life of very many different kinds, I hope, throughout the whole universe. But that is a purpose. You're going from a state of just primal energy with no consciousness or value at all to a state in which you've got communities of intelligent, rational beings capable of creating and appreciating new values. That's a, that's a huge uh, process which looks goal-directed. So. Mm-hmm. but uh, So that, that's a point at which I think there is a fundamental disagreement between those uh, people influenced by science who think there's no purpose at all and, and, and Christians, among other people, but certainly Christians, who say, well, there is a purpose and actually we're part of it. We're not the purpose, but um, the the evolution of intelligent life that is a purpose that a creator could could in really have mm-hmm. so um i know one of your uh um most uh committed critics at oxford uh dawkins uh, has some commentary on the god of the old testament and he has that quote where he says that the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, genocidal, you know, in that whole uh, um, yeah. rant that keeps he was going. having a bad day, I think, Richard Dawkins, uh, when he wrote that. Uh, <laughs> well, I know quite well, of course, and uh, he was overstressing the point. Um, to sell a book. I mean, frankly, you know, to say something like that gets attention, doesn't it? You're reading it even now. So uh, it's a one-sided view. I mean, uh, so I think you, when you read bits of the Old Testament, uh, you certainly have to say there are primitive views of God in it. I mean, one of the names for God in the Old Testament is the Lord of Hosts, which means the God of battles. You know, if it was translated properly, it would say he's the God of war. And you'd say, well, gosh, I didn't know I worshipped the god of war. And that's a bit of a shock. But you realize that that's how people, some people anyway, who got into the Old Testament, uh, saw God. God is um, uh, exercising justice in a sense of retributively punishing the wicked. And so war was a way of doing this. But of course... So you have to have a view then of uh, developing insights into what God was like. And when you get to Jesus, you know, Jesus, God is not a God of war. So you, that's a Christian task. You say, how, do, how does Jesus, God, uh, connect up uh, with the Old Testament God? And some Christians have said, well, he doesn't. Now, I don't believe that. I think he does. But the connection is a developing connection of coming to see that war is actually not the best thing you can think of. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So when you um, when you think of just the transformation of uh, the concept of God throughout the history of Scripture and such, how do you understand the breakthrough or transformation that the prophets bring to uh, biblical religion? Yeah, I mean, prophets were very important. Prophet, the later prophets like Isaiah, um, one of the Isaiahs, anyway, a prophet round then. Um, <laughs> It certainly changed uh, the view. I mean, it, for example, probably a lot of Israelites uh, up to the time of Isaiah were polytheists, and they thought there was a God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac, but there are lots of other gods as well, and uh, you get traces of this uh, in the Old Testament, and um, every now and again today explicitly says it. But Isaiah goes out and says, no, there's only one God, and the rest are all there unreal there's only one true god so that's a big change and and then ezekiel uh, brings about a great change when he says well um, a person should only be held guilty for their own sins uh, whereas before that people their whole family had been destroyed because what they didn't children got destroyed because they people didn't like their parents so you can see moral revolutions taking place through the prophets that's quite right and, and Jesus fits into that uh, prophetic line as saying, well, look, you, you've got to really think this through. They used to say uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth 
for a tooth. But really, you know, what you should think of is uh, love your enemy, which is quite a revolution. Mm-hmm. So revolutions come throughout the whole biblical record. You know? How does the question – as the understanding of God changes in Scripture and through the history of the church, how do you see that impacting the way we wrestle with the problem of evil and suffering? Right. Well, I think there have been lots of attempts uh, to respond to that problem uh, of evil and suffering. And I suppose one early attempt was to say, well, the good get rewarded, and if you suffer, it's because you've done evil. I mean, that was a very early view. You find it in one or two of the Psalms of you, you know, I, I have never seen a good man come to ruin. <laughs> but when you get to the book of Job, that really just flattens that whole way of thought and says, look, it's not like that. Um, it's You don't suffer because you've done something wrong. That's, that's not how it happens. Job doesn't know about the laws of nature, of course, but I suppose as, as we develop a more scientific view and say, well, look, if you've got a law of gravity, some people are going to be crushed to death. I mean, that, that's what happens. Oh, right. So unless God does a miracle, every time somebody jumps off a high building, um, then uh, bad things are going to happen. And earthquakes are going to happen. Volcanic eruptions are going to happen. And these things are involved in creating the sort of world with the sort of laws that we have. So I think, I think science, in a way the understanding of scientific laws and the necessity of having scientific laws helps Christians think about evil, natural evil anyway, as something that maybe is involved necessarily in creating beings like us, carbon-based intelligent life forms. So I'm not saying I've got the answer. I'm just saying uh, thoughts about evil in the place of God have developed and partly through scientific understanding about the laws of nature. Mm Mm-hmm. In, when um, when it comes to the New Testament, one of the things that you emphasized in a number of different books is the positive affirmation really being around the unlimited nature of God's divine love. And uh, can you kind of unpack how you see that being essential to the New Testament's testimony and um, yeah. what that means as a Christian to to wrestle with? Right. Well, I think the, the key text, of course, is in the first letter of John, where, where you get the phrase, God is love. And the word in Greek, which is important, is agape, because that's a specific sort of love, which I think you could say it's self-giving love. It's, it's a love that uh, costs something. So, so if God is costly love, um, that, that, that is really very different from a God who is a vengeful judge of the world. Um, and as Jesus says in John's gospel, um, I did not come to judge the world, uh, that, but, but rather to show light in darkness, you know, so it's, uh, the judgment is this, that people prefer darkness to light. That's what they do, but it's, it's not a, a vengeful judgment. So I think that phrase, God is love really is the heart of the Christian gospel. And you've got to work out what it means. It's easy to say it's much harder to work out what it means, but at least it means God is not vengeful. God doesn't uh, hate. Um, and anyone whose religion contains words of hate or even misunderstanding, you know, or, or stereotyping wrongly some other view, whether it be Christian or not, that person is not really uh, a person who believes that God is love and that we should be as much as we can like God, our character should be the character of, of self-giving love. Mm-hmm. So how do that's you? A hard, that's a hard, a uh, hard line to follow. You know, difficult in life to do that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so how do you understand the the kingdom of God and the different facets of it throughout Jesus' teaching? Right. Well, that's a fascinating one because nowhere in the New Testament does it tell you what the kingdom of God is. I mean, you, there are all sorts of theories about it. I mean, I, I could give you 15. I, I don't think I'll bother, but I could give you 15 theories about what the kingdom of God is. So I'll just give you my own. It's actually uh, the words are those of Adolf von Harnack, the uh, great patristic scholar in Germany, um, and um, who is known as a sort of father of liberal Christianity, which some people might think is bad, I don't know. But anyway, Hanek said, uh, well, um, this, the kingdom of God is the rule of the spirit in the hearts of men and women. And that's what I would 
taken to mean. That, that the, again, the kingdom of God is really the rule of God. So it's the uh, it is the rule. It doesn't. It's it's not a political kingdom. I think that's fairly clear in the New Testament. It's not political. And when Jesus started preaching, and it's interesting, people get the tense wrong when they do this. Uh, they often say Jesus preaching. Jesus said, uh, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." But actually, what it says is, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near to you." It's a past tense. It has come near to you. And it's an active tense. So it's something active happened. Spirit did something. But well, what did it do? Well, again, Jesus says, uh, if by the finger of God I cast out demons, then uh, then the kingdom uh, is among you. So the kingdom of God, for me, the rule of the spirit came with the person of Jesus. The spirit ruled in his life, and that was the kingdom. And his gift was to enable other people to share in that spirit. So so that's where I think the kingdom of God is. It's not a future political transformation of any sort. It is actually a, when people allow the spirit of God to rule in their lives, that is the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you see Jesus as the inheritance of uh, that spirit or that kingdom movement throughout uh, in the history of Israel? Like, in what ways is God's own ongoing self investment, re covenantal relationship with the people of Israel, the context for the the fruit of the kingdom becoming a real reality? Right. Well. I think I definitely want to be quite certain that I believe the covenant of God with Israel is still in force mm -hmm. and that Jews are right to feel that they are bound to God through obeying Torah, the law, which Christians aren't, of course. We're, we, we don't have that sort of law. So that covenant is still in place. So what Jesus did was open up. Uh, that whole idea of uh, covenant with God to people who weren't Jews, to the Gentiles. And in opening it up, um, he he changed it. I mean, it, or it, he didn't change it, but the disciples changed it anyway. <laughs> uh, and they, they got rid of the law. So you can eat pork and have sausages. And most mm -hmm. churches I go to serve sausages just to make sure that you're not Jewish. It seems to be so that's uh, that uh, you know, so there's a but I don't think the the war which has existed between Judaism and Christianity is as tragic and sad and bad and evil, and uh, it's not that at all. Um, it should be that the Jews have the original covenant with God, which remains in place, but that covenant's been extended uh, to the world. So you say, well, the history of Israel is tragic, it's a history of continual failure to obey the commands of God. That was true of the Jews, and it's true of us as well, because in our new covenant, we do the same. We turn the churches into some horrible, tyrannical, you know, obsessive, reactionary uh, edifices. Um, and that's what happens. God takes the initiative, humans spoil it, but God never gives up. So I think that's the story. And, and uh, I would regard myself as... Um, an honorary Jew, that is, I don't have to keep the law, but I've been admitted into fellowship with those who, with whom God made the original covenant. And I, I think the original covenant was that the Jews should be the priests of the earth. I mean, Isaiah says this, that, that it's their job to make the name of God or the nature of God known throughout the world. And of course, they didn't really do that <laughs> um, for lots of reasons, and, and because the nation was was destroyed originally. Uh, and I don't think we do it very well. But, it's a, but so we inherit the same sort of job through the priests of the earth. And perhaps for us that means, well, what would it be to be a priest of the earth and to treasure the earth and all the people on it and, and revere them? And so we get into the act as sort of um, God's second thoughts. Mm -hmm. you know? So, so how would you describe the incarnation um, in a way where Jesus isn't an aberration from the history of Israel and that covenant, but um, stitched into it? Because I think there's a sense that sometimes a any Christocentric account of Christianity, um, it's like the incarnation's a t type of divine intervention, and not kind of like the Didache describes Jesus as the fruit of the vine of David. And I love that image. 
because it's not this a, a violent rejection, but the the right. fruit that comes out of the God world relationship. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, that Jesus is, and he was, I'm sure, as recorded, his life was the life of a believing Orthodox Jew. Um, but he interpreted Torah. I mean, you remember Matthew's Gospel, start that he says, uh, you know, he who breaks the least of these laws is least in the kingdom. You know, that's, that's from an Orthodox Jew. So, um, there's, uh, so Jesus was, I think, an Orthodox Jew. But, of course, he opened uh, Judaism out to the rest of the world. So that uh, that was the change. So it wasn't that mm-hmm. he wasn't mm-hmm. Jewish. <laughs> he was Jewish. Um, but as he also made possible uh, a, a set of churches which uh, were able to uh, take that Jewish inheritance and use it more widely. So he he is the Jew in a way. I mean, he's the proud for me. He's the paradigm Jew. He's what a Jew ought to be. He, he's uh, totally uh, loyal to the will of God, even to the point of death. And so, how do you understand uh, the theological affirmation of the incarnation and its relationship to the historical person Jesus? Well, I go along with John's gospel, um, mm-hmm. really. I start where John does. As a philosopher, that's not surprising. We start with the abstract rather than anything that actually happens in history. If, if you start <laughs> with the abstract, you, you say, well, uh, this is the eternal word of God. So, they, And, that, you know, the logos, in the beginning was the word, the logos. And that can mean thought or reason. Right? So I have to think of that eternal word of God as the God's thought of everything that could ever be in its most perfect form. Um, that is what was incarnate in Jesus. So you can see um, a little m- analogy I use, which m- m- is meant to be helpful, is that an architect can have a plan of a building, but a builder will make that physically real. So you might say the thought of God, the Logos, uh, like the architect's plan for humanity and for life in the universe. Um, But the actual physical creation and the person of Jesus in particular is the making physically real of that plan. So you might say, well, the person of Jesus, he's really a human being. Absolutely. No question about it. But that human being is pretty uniquely for various reasons. Um, the, uh, the the perfection of God's plan of what a human being should be like. So that's how I think of the incarnation, really. And that's through the power of the Spirit of God. I mean, it mm-hmm. is uh, a gift of divine life, which is known in lots of people. But I think for, for Christians, Jesus represents, uh, because of a historical situation, um, because of his own life, and, um, and because I think it's true, God's thought was incarnate in him. I would say he really, his life was lived out um, to embody that thought, which ours are not, so, um, is it pretty obvious, really. Um, so that's how I think of incarnation. Yeah, it's the embodiment of God's thought of what humanity should be like. Mm-hmm. So how, what do you see Scripture's role when thinking through uh, contemporary ethical challenges or predicaments or discussing morality? Wow. Right. Well, um, we started off talking about my book, Love is His Meaning, which is based on a quotation from Mother Julian of Norwich. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, in in that book, I do uh, make the claim that in the Gospels, Jesus never uh, gave a new ethical principle. I mean, he already had all the Jewish laws to go along, and he reinterpreted those, yes, yes, and he made them deeper in many ways, matters of the heart, not just of external behavior. But he didn't have any new moral rules. So the only thing that Jesus said, well, you call it new, was love your enemy, or possibly you should love as I have loved you. You could say that was it. But it's not a rule. And it's just a it's so general that you wouldn't know, I mean, does that mean you can have an abortion or does it mean you can commit suicide or does it mean you can go to war? But it doesn't tell you that. It says whatever you, you must think it, it's to do with love. You've got to you know, think about that, but that's not easy. So I think Jesus never in the New Testament gives a moral rule. He never answers a straight question or 
he never gives a straight answer to a question saying, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Well, what do you say? Um, you know, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Well, you think, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> How much is God's? Everything, presumably, but then something is Caesar's. So you're left with a puzzle. And I think that's what Jesus does. He, he puzzles us in ethics. I mean, he says, yeah, love, that, that's, very, that's what's important. And the laws aren't um, unimportant, but maybe as Paul went on to say, the spirit gives life, but the law kills. So unlike Judaism and unlike Islam, Jesus gave no moral laws that had to be obeyed. Now, that's very important. Now, churches give moral laws. They make all sorts of rules. <laughs> And, you know, depending on which church you belong to, um, you might go along with it or you might not. Um, but Jesus didn't do that. So anybody who says Jesus taught this, whether it's about divorce or abortion, which he never mentioned, of course, or gay sex, which he also never mentioned, or any of those big uh, ethical issues today, um, you won't find the answer. You, you'd be told if you hate anyone, that's wrong. Unless you love even those who disagree with you, um, you're not doing what's right. But you don't have a rule to follow. Mm -hmm. you shouldn't, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a rule. You can't get one from the teaching of Jesus. Yeah, I, I was talking with a cognitive scientist a couple weeks ago, and, um, and, and he was very confident that religion – one of the problems with religion was that it just takes these old ethics and keeps applying them to things. And yeah. and I said, well, I think one of the brilliant things about Jesus is that he's actually against ethical finality, that uh, the af yeah. like the affirmation or call of universal love at the heart of the gospel is auto deconstructive to just ethical systems that yeah. uh, that Jesus succeeded by by separating you from whatever form of ethical closure or ideology you masqueraded as God's. And then put responsibility back on you, and 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 I wonder if like there's a sense that we should be paying more attention to how ideology and thing and tribalism and stuff is being understood scientifically to recognize that that yeah that might be one of the more brilliant things about Jesus that we misunderstand if we get in a fight and actually decide to argue about a particular issue and put Bible verses next to it. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, I mean, the, the, all the trouble about gender is very uh, it is very relevant to that because you might look back at things in the Old Testament and say, "Oh, I'm going to take those to tell me what to do." But actually, we know that Jesus didn't do that himself. I mean, that he was quite able to say, uh, "Oh, you shouldn't work on the Sabbath," but on the other hand, you know, uh, he, here we are: the uh, Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So. Um, he didn't use the rules inflexibly. And I think it would be quite, quite anti-Christian to take some written rule, usually in the Old Testament, and say that is going to govern your attitude to gender. You just have to say, no, they were a patriarchal lot. And a lot of people still are. And that's got nothing to do with love. And probably patriarchalism undermines true love, I would say, but Jesus didn't say that either, but I guess, I think he would have uh, approved of me saying that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, uh, how do you understand the, the the dream of Peter in Acts 10, where uh, you know nothing Jesus said in his entire, in any of the Gospels, makes you lead up to less uh, circumcision optional. Um, Jesus yeah. was uh, an actual Jewish uh, prophet, teacher, yep. and yet the spirit of the risen Christ in Acts is telling Peter, um, Christ has progressed past where Jesus was. And, That's right. and I feel like that story and wrestling with it's important because a lot of the challenges the church faces today are similar. And if we just think about the the way the next 30, 40 years are going to be impacted by the growth of new technologies, we're going to be asking all sorts of questions that there's no biblical reference for, let alone like same-sex marriage or something. And yeah. we need to have uh, uh, the the narrative resources to reflect and ask these type of questions. And and I don't and I don't see uh, 
partisan lobbying at each other from sides really creating the context to do that? No, no, that's that's absolutely right. I, I think it's very sad that that uh, you get this. Uh, it's, but it is because some some Christians do think that there are rules in the Bible that you ought to follow, and I think that's a very non-Christian attitude. It's an extraordinary attitude, really, because um, the whole of the uh, Torah, it, but it's clearer in Paul actually the, uh, than in uh, the Gospels that. Um, the whole of the Torah is finished for Christians. It's not there. And the thing that people don't realize about this is that the Torah, the Jewish law, contains as a main element the Ten Commandments. So Paul is actually saying even the Ten Commandments are finished. And you've got to think about this. What does that mean? Um, well, it's more radical than you might think. And, of course, Paul was aware that some people said, oh, we can do anything we like. We can, we can go and kill people or we can have sex with everybody we like, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, well, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. You've still got to think what makes for human good and welfare and flourishing. But that's your test. It's not, it's not anything written in a nation book. Uh, so that's Paul. And you, you say, well, you implied anyway. How did you get from Jesus to Paul? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, but I think that um, my view, anyway, is that in the Gospels, Jesus does teach that you should keep the Jewish Torah. So it was only when actually um, the Gospel uh, appealed to Gentiles by the thousand that you had the problem. Have they got to become Jews first? And, and so that was a new problem. It never occurred before. And so the, the early disciples of Jesus had to sort it out. And they had an argument at what is called the First Council of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 15. Mm -hmm. And they had an argument. And they came to a compromise uh, solution that they didn't have to be circumcised because there was no anesthetic and that was a bit painful. Um, but they still had to eat kosher food. They meat without the blood in it. So And... Later, that compromise was gone as well. So they believed, the early Christians believed, and that's where all our testimony comes from, the early Christians believed that they were not bound even by the words of Jesus. Or to put it another way, they were bound by his teaching that you should love, but not by the fact that he kept himself the Jewish law. So in that sense, they were not bound by Jesus. Um, they went below the surface to find the deeper meaning of what he was like. And I think that was a revolution. I think Christians need to know and accept and take to heart that Christianity was a revolution in the first generation. Mm -hmm. And then it's gone backwards ever since probably. Well, and we were uh, together in, in California. One of the things when we had this conversation that uh, I was struck by that uh, Amy Young emphasized was uh, the, that a lot of Protestants, especially more progressive Protestants, miss how powerful the, er, the the role of being baptized into the body of Christ played in the early church, right? And so a lot of the ways this conversation would normally be framed is one where, you know, you have like the historical Jesus, and you aren't bound to his Judaism, but you're bound to this principle of love. And yeah. there's this undercurrent that, no, through the life of the Spirit, we're baptized into the body of Christ, which is a living body. Um, yeah. generation to generation. And so a lot of the ways we ask questions like where's, you know, the historical Jesus or uh, where's Christ or where's the spirit are, are already de-spiritualized to a point we miss the framework the early church was appropriating. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm getting what you're getting out there. Chip. Well, that, um, um, the, uh, you know, so, so when when Peter is given the vision of unclean animals yeah. multiple right. times, says take and eat, and uh, in in kind of a post enlightenment church context, if it's a different issue, you're the fight is you're either being faithful to the Bible or you're not. Or liberals are like, well, the essence of Jesus's teaching is right. this, so let's go. And Amos yeah. said, no. Christ was alive. Like you were baptized into the body of Christ. The spirit of Christ is at work. So you're act, like, he was just being faithful to what Jesus or the Christ is up to in that moment. And, yeah. and liberal Protestants, especially those that aren't uh, open and relational panentheists, uh, tend to minimize the ever present working of the spirit. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, of course, that's an emphasis of Pentecostalism now, isn't it? That mm -hmm. The spirit can say new things. 
Uh, but I suppose, however conservative your church is, you ought to be saying the Spirit is expected to do new things. If the Spirit leads you into all truth, well, it hasn't got there yet. And so there are lots of new things to learn yet. And uh, as we get more understanding of the world, and um, then we will have to approach things in new ways. So we can't be bound. So the slightly difficult problem for Christians, well, how much of Jesus are we bound by? You know, uh, and I, But I suppose the general answer to that is we can't be bound by little details like um, did you take the Passover and things like that. You can't be bound by details. But it can be bound by the general character of his life as, you know, sitting without caste and um, forgiving and uh, being against religious hypocrisy, you know, certain things which stand out. And you have to discern what those are. And I think the spirit could give discernment, which will be new in each age as things go on. So I think it's important to see Christianity as a growing, developing, changing, yeah, uh, living body of Christ in the world. In, yeah. uh, in one of your books, uh, The Future of Christianity or something like, uh, something like that, um, oh, yeah. Um, you you actually argue something like that about the the birth of liberation theologies and theologies of the oppressed from the global south and such that yeah. uh, in one sense right it's re it restating important prophetic commitments in the life of Jesus and the history of Israel and such and another yeah. it's saying that in our globalized economic situation and the way the world is set up this is where the broken body of Christ is and we have to attune to it. Yeah, I think that's one of the strengths of Christianity, really, uh, that it, it is uh, focused on a person and not on a teaching. It's not a set of things that you read out and say, we must do this. Uh, the Gospels don't do that. They point you to the person of Jesus and try to evoke in you what like a personal encounter with that person. So... I think that's the strength of Christianity. It's it's not rules. It's a person, and that person is to be met in in the community of disciples. Uh, and we must never think we've got it right. You know, we have the answer, but we must always be thinking um, that's the what we need to strive towards. Yeah. So um, a couple a couple questions that people are in the group asked, and you can answer them as short um, as you want, or expound on them uh and and one was just because i mentioned i was going to talk to you today and someone wanted to know how would you as a philosopher and theologian uh look at questions around human cloning uh, and the and the uh monetization of modifying the human Ah, well, those are two different questions, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there might be medical reasons for cloning, uh, which have nothing to do with monetization. Um, uh, I'm afraid I would say I take it case by case. I don't have a general feeling this ought to be banned at all costs. I think if, if there were um, medical benefits to be gained by cloning, um, then I don't think you should make a clone in order to use a liver for somebody else, for example. Because, but you should respect that clone as a as a person in its own right and be fully human, obviously. So you mustn't use it as a means to an end. But given that, um, I, I would have thought medical cloning is uh, is permissible. And the difficulties with you say monetization, and I think the difficulties come when people might be using it for purposes which are less than um, morally acceptable. I mean, um, you know, for, if you use cloning for purposes of um, warfare, for example, it's a, uh, which people want to do, I know, uh, I would oppose that. But then your moral, your moral objection is not to cloning as such, it's to the uses to which it's put. So that would be my answer, really, that it's, uh, I, I don't see there's anything wrong with cloning. Um, unless it uses persons as a means to an end. Yeah. Yeah. I think the monetization part was kind of connected to the conversation around designer babies, right? Like yeah, design. if you know that your child is going to have a disease and you can intervene and have a healthy child without a disease, 
um, you could see developing that technology pretty quickly to to just give children and parents uh, you know higher success rate of healthy relationships with children and such. Yeah. But then when they all start uh, having the brain of Einstein and the looks of Brad Pitt uh, and <laughs> and company, and then you know then it becomes a real class thing as to uh, where when treatments like that are available and they're you know extending. Yeah your yeah. natural competitive advantage in the market and all that kind of stuff, it becomes a, a, a cycle of two classes of it, people. It does. Well, you're putting the ethical dilemma perfectly, and that, it is a dilemma. So, I mean, the, again, there's no clear answer to it. And uh, you, uh, I, generally, I suppose one would think that there's nothing wrong with making a person, a baby, more intelligent than otherwise would have been. I don't believe if you created... Even if you cloned Einstein, I don't believe they would both invent the theory of relativity, for example. <laughs> you know, there are other factors. Genes aren't magic. I mean, they, they, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't make you into uh, the genius that some people are. I think there's more to it than that. Um, so I don't have those sorts of fears. But yeah, yeah, you, they're, they're sensitive ethical problems. So uh, you know, Christians don't have magic answers. You've just got to say, look, we're committed to very important things, to respect for every human individual, and I would say even to special care for those who are poor or underprivileged. I think that's a Christian duty. Um, and uh, to social justice, definitely. Uh, but when you get into real ethical dilemmas, uh, I think you just were feeding our way and saying, well, perhaps you should be cautious, but, uh, you know, if, if these are making for more health and um that that is not bad so well, one of the other questions was if keith was doing advisement on uh, our christian education plan at church what are the basic uh scientific concepts or ideas that we should introduce so that when as people participate in the life of the church they don't see science as having made god obsolete no well, I think actually the BioLogos program of uh, Francis Collins, I think that, that seems to me a pretty good uh, way of going. Um, I, I think it's very important to um, read reputable, uh, scientifically informed people uh, and realize how many scientists actually are re religiously inclined and, and how many are Christian too. Um, so I don't think I make specific uh recommendations about that i think it is important though that there should be scientific education for christians that christians should really know um the the general facts about two main things i would say one is um evolution and the other is um well, I can't recall the other thing. <laughs> now, evolution is is important to know. I, I think uh, quantum physics. I think I know. I know that's terribly difficult, but I think people should be aware that physics is at a transitional stage, and uh, the, the, it's far from being the case that scientists know everything, and we're coming into a, a very different age, which is much less materialistic in in quantum physics, especially. So I think the outlines, there are lots of easy outlines you can find, you know, as easy as you can get in these things. Uh, and I think Christians should be scientifically informed. Um, and there should be sermons about um, about the scientific view of things. And, and these sermons shouldn't, um, shouldn't speak as though Christians, because of their faith, have a special scientific competence. It's very important for people to say, if they're going to talk about biology, for example, how qualified are they? Now, <laughs> you know, I don't think most of us are qualified to have an opinion. We're going to rely on somebody else's authority. So it's important to identify the authorities we're depending on and to ask, well, are they accepted by other experts in their field? And I think, that, in a way, that's the hardest thing for Christians these days, to know, well, in interpreting the Bible, who are the experts? Um they disagree. So how do we find out which which ones are competent? And then um, and the, the educational process is to learn how to discern and and how difficult it is to do that. And so to be a little bit humble <laughs> and a little bit agnostic about making dogmatic statements. Mm -hmm. you know? 
So the the last question is, um, so how do you, how do you understand the scripture speaking to your own understanding of the cross, salvation, and the resurrection of Christ? Well, I think the crucifixion in itself is one of the most uh, probable facts <laughs> that we've got in history. Um, the resurrection it doesn't have the same public um, evidence for it. But I, I certainly accept the biblical account of the resurrection. Um, yeah, so I think the disciples did see uh, Christ after his death in a, in a different form. And uh, so I, I fit into a, a pattern of general orthodoxy. You know, you say, yeah, I think the cross was important. Uh, Christ was giving his life for the sake of the world and to, to unite people to God. And Christ rose from death, and I believe we share it in the resurrection life. So I I accept those main doctrines. But then as a philosopher, I know that those doctrines were then clothed in the terms of Greek philosophy. So a lot of Greek philosophy went into it. Some of the creeds, you know, the Trinity is three persons in one substance, a lot Mm -hmm. of Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think what we have to do is say, well, Greek philosophy was very good philosophy, but it's a long time ago, you know, a couple of thousand years or even more. So maybe we need some new philosophical approaches. Um, so to see how much human speculative thinking has gone into what we call Christian doctrines and to say, well, those those can be reformulated. But the basic facts, yeah, the cross, the resurrection, their historical testimonies, uh, and, and I don't see why uh, an intelligent person shouldn't be prepared to accept them. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I uh, thank you for hanging out on the internet. Okay, right. And uh, talking and answering questions. It is yeah. always good to see you.